Okay, so um, if you're ready to go, um, we are so happy on behalf of the Center for the Humanities at New York University to welcome two distinguished guests who are actually colleagues in the same department, the Department of Journalism, um, the Carter Institute, so I want to welcome the two of you, first of all, Pamela Newkirk and Sukino Mehta. I'll introduce you briefly. And we are excited and the occasion really why we're bringing you in here is together is to celebrate the publication of this book. I'll have to remove my sticky note from it. Yeah. And is our Land and Immigrations Manifesto by Professor Mehta. And then Pamela Newkirk's book, Diversity Inc. just came out in paperback about two weeks ago and we'll refer to these two works, but of course the conversation is directed by you. Pamela Newkirk is a um, professor at New York University, an award-winning journalist who's published several books, and I'll just mention the titles of several of these books. Spectacle, The Astonishing Life of Ota Benga, where you chronicle the life of an African who was heavily imprisoned in the Bronx Zoo, and you've brought that story to the attention with an effect today, you may wanna talk about that what it means to do this kind of archival research and how it can change today's stories. Several other books are Letters from Black America um, and Within the Veil, Black Journalists, White Media. And you have a lot of experience as a practicing journalist, being on award-winning teams, and you write for the public and are deeply engaged in conversations that our country is uh, undertaking right now about diversity, about our relationship to the past, about race, um, and other topics that we'll touch on. And uh, Sukido Mehta is also associate professor in the Department of Journalism at New York University. So Sukido, thank you for coming today uh, from New York. Um, his, one of his books is Maximum City, Bombay Lost and Found, a wonderful book um, that was a finalist and has won several prizes and has really changed the way in which people think about global cities. And then this recent book, This Land is Our Land, An Immigrant's Manifesto, which is a journey really to America and through America, which includes both personal accounts and then a long set of in-depth conversations and interviews with people who are living through the reality of being Americans now, of being immigrants in America, all over the world. So you're tackling questions that are on the forefront of our political world. And I want to start you out by asking you a question that I feel is in both of your works um, present and that I think may get us into an interesting conversation. And I'll give you just two sentences back from your own books. Mm -hmm. And these questions concern the way we frame or think about these issues and who has the power to frame the stories that actually guide our public conversations. And in uh, Suketu's book, there's a, in the middle of the book, you're reflecting on the way in which immigration is talked about in America and in the world. And you say that a battle is being fought today in the public square, in the political conventions, on television, in the op-ed pages, a battle of storytelling about migrants. And this is something I think you can start us out with. And then Pamela, your book, Diversity, Inc., which is about the billion dollar industry that is supposed to produce good effects to actually create equity and equality, and especially corporate America. You looked at academia, Hollywood, and progressive institutions in particular. And you say, the plotting pace of change a half a century later, after the start of the kind of diversity initiatives, makes clear the need to reframe the diversity conversation of recent years from a rosy, we are the world ideal to one fired by a mission to combat systemic racial injustice and pervasive delusion about where we stand. So both of you are we're writing these books to say there is a battle over how to frame a story. Mm -hmm. One is about immigrants and one is about race. They are linked, they are connected. And maybe Sukato, you can start us out by thinking, how did you get into this idea to write a book to tell a story that is both personal, but also informed by you as a journalist, as a researcher, and someone who has been in the field and has, you made your own journey across the world. And to say what motivated you, and then Pamela, you can tell us what motivated you to write your book, which is also an effort to reframe a conversation. Okay, uh, thanks Oli, um, uh, truly an honor to be here with my wonderful and gifted colleague, Pam. Um, what motivated me to write this book really was a remark 
that um, a story my grandfather told me. So my grandfather um, was born in rural Gujarat in India when the British still ruled India. And he um, lived most of his life in Kenya when it was ruled by the British and then retired to Britain. Uh, and he was sitting in a, a park in um, Northeast London one day in the 1990s when an elderly British gent comes up to my grandfather and wags his finger in his face and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your own country? And my grandfather, who was a businessman much of his life said, why are we here? Because we're the creditors. You came to my country and you stole my gold and my diamonds. So we have, to, we have come here to collect. We are here because you were there. And you know, he told me this story, um, and I could sense in this story was decades of hurt, decades of being questioned about his status in um, these countries he had moved to. And he had moved because the British had essentially robbed India blind. When the British uh, came to India, um, India's GDP uh, was at the time, I mean, not that anyone had specific measures, but it was an estimated uh, one quarter of the world's GDP. 200 years later, when the British left, um, India's GDP was 4% of world GDP. So basically, you know, the British, um, like all colonial powers, ruled these countries to enrich themselves. And that, that set me thinking about the narrative around immigration uh, in the West, in uh, the US, in the UK, uh, in Europe. And, and the prevailing narrative is that um, immigrants like myself, like so many uh, of us who you know, watching this, have come to take. Um, and the narrative of uh, the populists around the world is that um, uh, immigrants are the sort of vanguard of, um, uh, of globalization that they come, uh, they make a countries poorer, uh, and uh, that often they're, they're robbers and rapists and terrorists and drug dealers. And this sort of narrative has led to a number of populist leaders from Orban in Hungary um, to uh, Boris Johnson in the UK to Trump in the US. Um, it, it's been instrumental in their elections. So I started looking at the ways that stories are built around uh, immigration. Um, and I started uh, meeting migrants to get their stories. Um, well, first of all, about why they moved. Um, and I also started meeting government officials, uh, like people with the Border Patrol, to see how um, you know, their storytelling around migrants. I spoke to politicians. And I took a deep dive into the research. So, the fear of migrants is magnified by lies about their numbers. Um, and patients and researchers uh, train minds to think of them as a horde. In all the rich countries, people, especially those who are poorly educated or right-wingers, think that immigrants are a much bigger share of the population than we really are. So a recent study found that Americans think that the foreign born make up around 37% percent of the population. In reality, we are only 13.7 percent. In other words, in the American imagination, we are three times as large as we really are. The French think that one out of three people in their country is Muslim. The actual number is one out of 13. British respondents to the same poll predicted that 22 percent of the people will be Muslim by 2020. The actual projection is only six percent. So a populist is whether it's Putin or Modi in India or Trump in the US, is a gifted storyteller, someone who can tell a false story well. And the only way he can be fought is by telling a true story better. And this is where journalists like me and Pam come in. Um, with storytellers, we know how to um, gather the data and we know how to shape it into an engaging narrative and take it out to a general audience. And this is why Journalists like us are feared and hated by populists uh, 
around the planet. This is why uh, in India, the country of my birth, uh, journalists are being jailed, um, sued in defamation cases, uh, having their the taxes audited, or outright murdered um, uh, at rates which uh, uh, India has never seen. Um, it's why Trump keeps attacking journalists as fake news and actually encourages his supporters at rallies to physically beat up journalists. Um, all around the world, we're seeing this attack on the, uh, by the populists, and much of it is around the issue of immigration. Because we can take stories, you know, we can take these, these narratives um, and actually do something with them, with, the, with this marriage of um, statistics and stories. Um, to actually challenge this narrative. And that's deeply uh, disconcerting to the populists. I find this fascinating, Suketu, the combination of deep research, statistics, interviewing migrants and customs officials, border patrol officers, workers, activists, populists. So you actually speak to all sides of the spectrum in order to shift a misperception. And Pamela, you engage in the same work to correct a story that, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that because I think those two issues are so linked in the American yeah. public conversation right now. That would be helpful. Yes, but first of all, thank you, uh, Uli and the Humanities Institute. And it's an honor to be with you and, and with um, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Suketu. So yeah, narratives. Um, when I started working on this book, it was still important to kind of challenge this notion that we were in a post-race race nation and that, um, you know, there were these gaping disparities, uh, particularly between Blacks and Whites on matters of policing, uh, income, uh, you, you name it. Uh, all of the disparities had been sort of like just wiped away and you know in fact one of the dominant narratives is that now it is white men who are facing the most discrimination so sadly since the tragic killing of george floyd i no longer have to invest as much time trying to explain <laughs> why black lives matter or trying to explain that we're not a post-race nation despite the election of Barack Obama and some of the symbolic achievements um, by, by African Americans. So I wanted to look at the issue of diversity to interrogate the tension between the incessant rhetoric around diversity that has trailed me throughout my careers, both in daily journalism for 10 years and then later in the academy for another 25 years. Diversity has been a preoccupation in both fields. We hear so much about diversity, the need for diversity. And yet I wanted to interrogate the tension between the rhetoric, the billions of dollars that are annually expended on diversity initiatives and the lack of diversity. The needle is barely moving. Decade after decade, we see a radical underrepresentation of people of color in every influential field. And when, when we talk about African Americans in particular, that's where you see an even more acute underrepresentation despite the, the kind of, um, you know, uh, feeling by many people that we've already crossed that bridge, racial equality has been achieved. So like I said, we no longer have to make that case um, because of the sacrifice of, of George Floyd, that there is greater attention to both uh, the issue of racial injustice and this whole issue of diversity and how we have not made nearly uh, the kind of progress that for the past at least decade or more that has been celebrated as if we, we've overcome. So that's what I wanted to look at. And I wanted the book um, to be driven by data, looking at the, the numbers, at the metrics. And, and I think, you know, we can delude ourselves by looking at symbols of progress, but when we look at the, the real numbers, we see uh, whether we're talking about in business, where um, 
the, the, the percentage of black men hasn't changed in decades. It's gone from 3% to 3.2% in companies of 100 or more. If we look at the academy, African Americans uh, hold like 4% of, of professor uh, ships uh, uh, at universities and for Latinos, the number is like 3%. Um, if we like, you can look no matter where you look, whether you look at fashion, whether you look at Hollywood, whether you look, you could look at no matter where you look, you see this acute underrepresentation that has not been addressed, even though we see this burgeoning apparatus around diversity. We see the hiring of chief diversity officers. We see all of the money being poured into initiatives which have not borne fruit. And so one of the key questions that, that I'm raising in the book is why do we keep doing the same thing and, and expect different results? That we have to change the way we're looking at this issue if we are serious about the business of actually increasing diversity and not merely paying lip service to diversity. Can you both say something about how, um, how, you, how you would define how to approach the topic of migration or immigration in America or the topic of Pamela, what you call in the title of your book, Diversity, in this current moment when there is a huge contest of who's defining it. You'll ask different people on different parts of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. They'll see it very different. Yeah, it was, so part of the problem with the whole conversation around diversity is that the, the, the word itself has been so overtaxed that it basically has eclipsed the whole issue of racial justice. It's become untethered from race in many ways because when we say diversity, it can mean sexual orientation, it could mean mental and physical capacity, it can mean, um, you know, gender, it can mean so many things, and that you can claim to have a diverse workplace without having any racial diversity. So that's where we are. Um, there, there was um, at Apple, their first chief diversity officer two years ago, said that 12 blue eyed, blonde, white men could illustrate diversity because of different backgrounds and different points of view. So that's where diversity has gone. And so what I wanted to do is pay sustained attention to the issue of racial diversity, because I believe that that has been overshadowed in this larger conversation about diversity. And it's um, uh, similar with migration. You know, part of the reason I wrote this book was that the whole conversation about migration in the rich countries is what's in it for the rich countries? Should we let in immigrants or not? How many? Should they be skilled or unskilled? Um, you know, what laws and should, should they follow laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I thought, how about the point of view of the migrants themselves? Why would someone leave their homes, their language, their culture, most importantly, their families, and undertake this incredibly perilous journeys across deserts, across mountains, across rivers, across oceans, taking their little kids in their hands. What is it that has made life so hellish in their home countries? And who did it so that they have no option but to move? So then I've broken the, I, I started you know, looking for the reasons and it, came down to essentially four uh, reasons for global migration, which is um, there are more people who are uh, immigrants today um, than ever before. There's a quarter of a billion people like me who are living in a country other than the one they were born in. So why are people moving? Um, it's because of colonialism and corporate colonialism, which is what replaced colonialism, war and climate change. And the greatest driver of migration in uh, our century is going to be climate change. So, you know, just to take one of those, uh, uh, climate change, there's a tremendous amount of hypocrisy uh, in the whole conversation around climate change. There's this demand that, you know, countries like India uh, should control their emissions. Um, well, the United States, we account for 4% of the world's population, 
but we put one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the European countries, another quarter. And the effects of climate change are being felt much more um, by the poor countries, the California wildfires notwithstanding. Um, large parts of South Asia are going to be literally uninhabitable uh, between the middle and the end of this century, um, just because it'll be too hot for human beings to even go outside. Uh, already they're having enormous effects on these countries' economic growth. So, you know, what are these people to do? Large numbers of them are moving because they have no choice. Uh, or take war. Um, we Americans went into Iraq and launched an illegal and uh, unnecessary war in which a million Iraqis uh, lost their lives. Uh, and the entire region was thrown into turmoil. So I'm arguing for migration as reparations. Um, you know, there should be a million Middle Easterners who are given green cards to enter the United States as a consequence of what we did. There's also this, this other kind of um, hypocrisy around illegal immigration. Um, even some of the Democrats, Biden once, uh, when talking about um, uh, migration said, well, you should get in line. So the idea is that, you know, people who want to enter the United States should do so legally. Well, ask yourself this, has the West ever gone yeah. anywhere legally? Did the West ever ask permission to enter other territories legally? So this kind of, you know, legalism now, uh, this fiction that, uh, you know, you can come to the US border and if you have um, a well-founded fear of persecution, which is what asylum cases, uh, the, the whole legal rationale for asylum, which the U.S. is a signatory to international covenants on asylum for, is um, the idea that if you ask um, and you've got this well-founded fear, you can prove it, then you'll be let in. Well, actually, under the Trump administration, asylum has almost been eliminated. Um, it, the, there's been a whole series of measures the administration has taken, like the remain in Mexico policy, where you know if you're fleeing the gangs in El Salvador, you'll be told to go back to uh, Mexico and wait there uh, for however many months or years it takes to process your asylum claim. And I've been in Mexico, I've been in these shelters for migrants, and I know that the gangs follow them there. I know that the um, uh, Central American gangs uh, have um, uh, men stationed uh, in and around the shelters in places like Tijuana, and they actually um, uh, follow and they, they know who's, who's staying where. So it's not as if these asylum seekers are safe in Mexico. But, you know, again, uh, ask yourself, who created these situations in Central America? Um, you know, at one point, one American company, the United Fruit Company, owned 42% of all the land in Guatemala. Um, we, we talk about their gangs and their guns. Well, three quarters of all the guns in Mexico and 98% of all the guns in the Bahamas come from the United States. And anytime there's any kind of international action, say the UN, to um, stop this flow of small arms, the NRA comes in and leans on the administration, Democratic and Republican, to stop any action on this matter. So what I'm arguing for in the book is immigration as reparations. You know, we and in the European countries, the rich countries, we've gone out and done bad things and exploited these countries um, to make ourselves richer. Um, and the least we can do is let in people from these blighted areas. And as I show in my book, when we do this, everyone benefits. Uh, we benefit, uh, and the immigrants benefit, and the countries that they leave behind benefit. So, so Kato, uh, Pamela uses a term in her book called, there's a kind of, and she calls it a morally impoverished calculus, which sets up the terms in the wrong way. And Pamela, you say there's this kind of persistence of this kind of fantasy of um, sort of an enduring fantasy of white preeminence and that white people are here, and if we change something, there's a cost, and that's unfair. 
So if there's real diversity, would be genuine work the way you describe in the book, then actually there's a loss. And you just said also, Sukhetu, there's a kind of story that if we let people in, they'll take things away. Right. So this is a calculus, and you're both trying to expand that. So let's say, Sukhetu, in your book and Pamela, in your book, you're expanding it to say there's a deeper story here. Yeah. It's not that these people want something they don't deserve, but let's talk about first who got what in the first place. <laughs> Well, you know, diversity, immigration, it's all viewed as a zero-sum game, that if these people benefit, then I lose. What we have seen historically, uh, and, and particularly over the past five decades, um, after uh, President Johnson's Great Society mm -hmm. programs, we saw the gap between Blacks and whites begin to, to close um, in education, attainment and, and poverty and, and uh, employment. We saw like this, this major progress happening and all without whites losing any ground. And yet there's this perception that if African-Americans make progress, that is going to hurt white, um, their status. And, and there's nothing that shows that that is the case, but you know, there are many who want to, f to fuel that perception that if you know if you have policies that um, are for affirmative action to address the the historic exclusion of people, then that's that's going to take from me. So you can look at these small examples of you know if you have a hundred, sure if you have a hundred marbles and I had all the marbles, yeah, with equality, <laughs> you're not going to have a hundred, but this is a land of plenty. We don't have just a hundred marbles. We have, there's so much that all of these groups are bringing to the table. And of course they should take something away from the table as well. And yet, you know, there are those who want to just um, pretend that the only people who deserve to have a decent life, a decent income, um, inclusion are the original Americans and who are the original <laughs> Americans? Like, so the whole thing is out of whack. I mean, when you talk about narratives and who gets to frame the narratives, um, obviously uh, many people who are implicated in this American experience have been left out of the telling of these stories. And, and that's why the story has been so distorted to the point that it's almost unrecognizable from the true history of this country. So what Suketu is saying is, um, it's in a way different. I mean, we're, we're looking at a different set of issues, but in many ways, we're basically saying that there is another story to be heard and that you cannot just continually kind of tell a story that's not true. I mean, we're both journalists, so we're, we're working from facts. We're working from numbers. We're working from history. I mean, so, you know, not everyone will go for that because I think it has been so deeply ingrained in, in this country that A, is a zero-sum game, and B, that the true Americans are white. And so as long as people want to hold on to that, we're always going to be at odds because that that is not America and it never was America. It never was uh, solely a white country. There were people here <laughs> when Europeans arrived. Um, Africans were right behind um, Europeans. We were brought here. So we're all part of this experiment and we all need to have a say and not just these stories, but in the, the you know, the, the, the you know, we all have something to give and to take from this land. This land is our land too. And the stories you're both telling, these correctives, they are out there. So Cato, you write in your book, in spite of Trump, Americans and their Northern neighbors are still the most welcoming people in the world for immigrants. So actually your book ends on a note saying there is another reality. And Pamela, you're also saying not everybody is defensive. As writers, journalists, um, researchers, how do you actually shift that story? And let's talk a little bit about 
um, that we are faced with, you know, social media channels and the public discourse, sort of, how do you actually do that? Because I'm very interested, since you're both practicing journalists as well, do you shift the story when you say the story is actually out there? Well, well, I think it helps. Social media has certainly helped. Tra the tragedy of George Floyd has shifted the narrative a lot because now, you know, things that journalists like, like myself have been writing about, um, you know, injustice for years. And now when you see something that's just so visible and so horrific, I think it changed uh, people's perception of the, the issues of injustice. I mean, when you have Fortune 500 CEOs proclaiming that Black Lives Matter, we know the conversation has changed, right? Um, so, so now that um, we have the attention of uh, people in high places, it's now, so what do we do now? Like now that we're finally kind of on the same page and, and we see the inequality all around us, no one is denying it. Well, I shouldn't say no one. Um, we have a president who just signed an executive order punishing companies that um, do diversity training. <laughs> so not everyone's on this page, but we do have uh, far more Americans recognizing just um, how unequal our system of justice is. And, and then that, you know, also we can look at employment, we can look at all of these other things. So th these were uh, arguments that were harder to make when I wrote the book, it's, it's, um, there's far more um, receptivity now. So now the question is, what do we do about it? And it's funny that both um, what Suketu is writing about immigration and me diversity, these are two of the primary topics on the presidential campaign agenda. You know, they, they both came up last night in the debate. Um, they're spoken about ad nauseum. So these issues are actually on the ballot. And the thing that's so, uh, that I find unsettling is that there are many people who will vote in a certain way because they fear both immigration, even though most of them are the products of immigration, and they fear diversity um, because it's, it, they've both been so um, demonized. Uh, and, and you know, it's, they become like the, the boogeyman like diversity and, you know, that's why uh, Trump signs this executive order because he thinks white men are, are being, you know, beaten over the head about, you know, gender equality and racial equality. And he thinks that's racist and that's sexist. And so sadly, there are those who will vote in a certain way because they too are listening to this rhetoric and 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 just being influenced by the fear mongering around both of these issues. And I'll say one more thing, because I know Suketu has a lot to say about this. For years now, in 22 of the nation, 22 of the nation's largest cities, they're already majority minority. They haven't burned down. There's no, <laughs> there's nothing on fire. Like, it, the, like the fear mongering around diversity is just, it, it's not born out of anything real. You know, it's just not this scary thing that, that so many whites have been led to believe. So I just want to leave that thought there that many of our cities have long been diverse and they've long had more people of color than whites. And yet we find a way to get along just fine. So it's not, it's not this, you know, frightening, you know, apparition that, that, um, that it's been painted to be. Right, fear mongering, as Pam said. A positive statistic about the other is always crushed by a horror story about the other. So we proponents of immigration, of diversity, we've got the numbers on our sides. I mean, there's just no question that um, America would be finished without uh, immigrants and in continuing immigration. Um, the genius of America has been that it's always imported the talent that needs. Look around any university, any tech firm, any medical office, uh, and you know the evidence is right there. Uh, 
also the people who um, have most contact with immigrants in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it's in New York or London, tend to be the ones that are most resistant to anti-immigration messages. The people who voted for Brexit, the biggest own goal in British history, weren't people living in London. They were people um, living out in the rural areas who were fed a steady diet of fear by the Murdoch-owned papers. And here, the Murdoch-owned network um, spreads daily horror stories about immigrants. They don't so much have economists or academics or, you know, they don't really traffic in numbers. And our side, I think if we have a fault, is that we rely too much on numbers. We put out these reams of data showing that, you know, uh, immigrants are, are, are good for uh, the country, that without immigrants, uh, the social security system would collapse, that we are a rapidly aging nation, we need young immigrants. This is all true, but often numbers tend to make our eyes glaze over. So what we need is stories. And again, this is where we, uh, people like Pam and myself come in because we're storytellers. So, you know, I became interested in the storytelling around immigrants as criminals. Um, as essentially immigrants who are coming here to go after your family. It's a very powerful motive in American politics and Trump has used it repeatedly. Uh, these people from Mexico, they're not sending their best over here, the rapists and, you know, he trots out these uh, people who had their children um, murdered by, uh, or allegedly murdered by uh, the undocumented. That there are all these rallies, and they carry a very powerful message of fear for his base. So I set out to gather true stories, and I went to um, a place called Friendship Park. Uh, Friendship Park is uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, it's just south of San Diego, and it's the only place uh, in the entire 3,000-mile-long southern border where if you are on this side of the border and you want to see your family, then you can go there and uh, on weekends, um, there's a little stretch of, um, of park, which was inaugurated by the Nixon administration, where uh, it used to be you could go and meet your family, have a picnic with them, give them a hug, and then they would go back to Mexico and then you'd go back to the US and it didn't matter if you had papers or not. It was a place um, largely for the undocumented to make physical contact with the families. So under the Trump administration, there's um, a giant industrial mesh fence. And now um, uh, people can still go, but they can only meet their families for 10 or 15 minutes at a time across this mesh fence. So you can see your family, but you can't touch them. And I um, stayed there for two weeks and did some of the most heartbreaking reporting of my career as family after family came on both sides and just attempted to make contact. So I saw, for example, a Mexican man who um, had left uh, 17 years ago because his mother was sick and he needed to make money for her medical bills. And, you know, um, because of uh, the perilous economic conditions of Mexico uh, in which the U.S. has a large role to play, he could not make that kind of money in Mexico. So he came across the border and has been working in construction for the last 17 years. So every day he works brutally hard, seven days a week, and sends back almost everything he saves to his mother. And his mother really wanted to meet him. So finally, after 17 years, she comes from this rural area far in the interior of Mexico, and he comes from Colorado. He takes a series of buses because he can't fly. And I saw him as he went up to the fence. And he goes up to the fence and he puts his face up and his mom puts her face up on the other side. And he told me later, he could feel her breath on his face. And he said, I miss you, mama. And she said, I love you, son. And she says, I don't think you're eating enough. Are you eating right? You look too thin. Um, and then he put his hands up to the fence because the holes in the fence are only large enough to put your pinky finger through. And mom puts her pinky finger through and they touch their pinkies through a little hole in the fence. And all along the fence, there were mothers and sons 
brothers and sisters, best friends, husbands and wives, doing this kissing of the pinkies. It was some of the most heartrending scenes uh, that I've seen. And I thought if you know anyone doubts the family values of these immigrants, they should go to a place like Friendship Park and see that almost all of these immigrants who, who are here, documented or not, are doing it because they want the same thing that you or I do, a better life for our families. And I think it's this kind of storytelling, if there's anything that can reach Trump's base, um, at least some of them, it's going to be this kind of storytelling because Trump has made them incredibly resistant, resistant to experts and expertise. There's a tremendous anti-intellectualism now in American public life. Um, so they get their news from Facebook. And you know, it's interesting that the kind of news they get is in this kind of storytelling, this kind of horror storytelling. And the Fox News uh, people, the opinion people are very good at this kind of false storytelling, mm -hmm. as painting them as demons and drug addicts and rapists. And I think, you know, we could up our game and present these almost novelistic stories, which happen to be true of the, the wholeness of these immigrants and the reason they cross and the sacrifices that they make. So Ketu and Pamela, you both teach at NYU and can you follow up a little bit when you just said, Suketa, we have to up our game. We have to incorporate storytelling to counter another type of story that demonizes. And you say that is on the nightly news on, the, on Fox. Um, so at the same time, uh, storytelling, I teach literature, is often considered a sort of make-believe, it's fiction. So can you just say a little bit concretely, because I'm sure we have students here to say, how do you, how do, you do that? I mean, yeah. journalism well, is often... Well, journalism is partly the, the art of storytelling, as Suketu says. I mean, the only difference between journalism and, and fiction is that the stories we tell are true. Uh, they, they're based on corroborated evidence, right, and on interviews and, and data and history. So we can bring the literary devices um, to our work. So we don't have to write the story in a very dry kind of just the facts, you know, hard news. We can actually tell an engaging story like the story that Suketu just told using literary devices, but, but telling it um, based on, on facts. And, and both of us teach those kind of classes where um, students are, are learning um, different ways to tell stories. And so, Kato, when you came away from Friendship Park, I mean, that chapter is really heartbreaking and leaves you sort of with a sense of the lives lived and what people go through. How did you, when you, when you left those two weeks, how did you turn that into sort of, how do you turn this experience into something you can maybe do something for some of these people standing at this fence? Well, the first thing I did after just, you know, well, uh, particularly after speaking to this Mexican man, as he'd come back with tears streaming down his face, I ran to my car and I called my parents in New Jersey and I was bawling. And I told them how much I loved them. And, you know, if, you, if you've ever had any sort of rupture with someone in your family, go to Friendship Park and see what happens when there's a, a state that comes between you and your family. So look, th this kind of storytelling is incredibly important, but I also want to stress that the storytelling by itself is also not enough. That you need three things, and this is what I teach my students in my journalism classes. You know, as a fan, we teach um, long form nonfiction. So you need three things. One is stories, because stories are how you get to people. I mean, you know, um, the, the prophets of all religions spoke in parables. There's no section in the Bible that says, in a recent poll, 85% um, of people said it was good to be nice to your neighbor because then your neighbor will be nice to you, right? God speaks to us in terms of parables. Um, but those stories are just isolated anecdotes. Anyone can tell a story. And, you know, Trump is very good at this. He gets up and says, I met a fella in Paris who told me there were all these no-go zones. And I'm telling you, my friend Jim, and <laughs> some section of his audience can relate to that. Yeah, his friend Jim, you know, he, he got it from someone. It's, it's not enough just to have a story. You need the data. 
And this is another thing that we teach our students to do. Go out and comb through public records, read studies, um, speak to experts, um, speak to you know, economists, um, anthropologists, sociologists, politicians, um, and get the numbers so that they're not just random anecdotes. And then there needs to be a third thing after the, you've got the stories and the statistics. You need to have a statement or a series of statements. The stories and the statistics have to come together to make a strong argument. Um, the former editor of the Atlantic magazine, Bill Whitworth, once had a great formula for the perfect magazine story. Um, and his formula was the careful accumulation of facts leading to a surprising conclusion. Um, and I like that formulation because it's you know what we uh, try to do in our books. We try to gather um, numbers and stories that add up to something that might surprise the reader. And in my case, in my book, the surprising conclusion to my book, which starts out quite angrily, um, is that uh, in the end, uh, the story of immigration uh, has a happy ending that it is good for the immigrants themselves because uh, for them, it's literally the matter of uh, difference between life and death for many of them. It's good news for the countries they're moving to because the West isn't making enough babies and needs their skills and energy. And it's good for the countries that they move from because remittances are the best and most targeted way of helping the global poor. Last year, global remittances amounted to more than four times all the foreign aid sent by the rich countries to the poor countries. Um, so you know, that's, that's what um, uh, I try to teach my students. And it's just, it's the way we cut through the clutter, stories, yeah. statistics, and statements. Right. And, and you have to connect that to why does it matter? Like, why, why does this reader out there in the world, why should they care about this? So there has to be a link uh, to that. Like, why is this important? Is it about... Um, corruption? Is it about injustice? Is it about like why? Why does this matter? Suketo and Pamela, you also have done an enormous amount of research for these books to present it to the general public. Suketo, you talk about the origins of fear, which are an academic anthropology, and then a few books, which are these kind of dystopian fantasies, which have proven really resilient to counter stories. In the last few minutes, sort of, um, where do you think we are now, um, because I hear from both of you that actually you're, you're not hopeless or sort of completely pessimistic. You're saying that are other stories, and a lot of Americans know these other stories or live them or are connected to them. So where do you think these two, two big stories, immigration and migrants and race relations in America really, where are they right now? Where are they gonna go? And you don't have to predict the future. I wish you could. Yeah, I wish I could too. Yeah, I think we're at a really seminal moment. And I, I do think that, you know, I, I don't, I can't predict the future, of course, but I do see um, that there's a, the greatest potential for change on this issue that I've seen in my lifetime. That doesn't mean there will be change, but it means that the potential has not been greater in all of my adult years, uh, where there are more people who recognize the need to lean in. Um, to, to better educate themselves about, you know, this, this, this history, this void that has been just totally overlooked, overshadowed. And, um, and, and to me, that's a promising sign that, um, you know, that more of, particularly of white America is, is uh, we've seen a real shift in attitudes around the Black Lives Matter movement around um, the need for police reform, you know, whether we're talking about like defund the police on the one extreme, we're just like, we need to do something. Um, I think there's just this greater recognition of that. And that, you know, that's promising now. Will we have the political, I think we'll have the will and now we'll need the people in place who can do this. That I'm terrified about this next election and whether the will of the people will actually prevail. But um, if it does, uh, then, then I'd be very optimistic about seeing, if not monumental systemic change, just progress on this issue of uh, diversity. And when I say diversity, I, I mean justice. 
Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of um, social justice, I have never seen a movement gather so much steam so much rapidly in my lifetime. Exactly. Um, and I'm, I'm truly amazed and actually, you know, thrilled in this very difficult year to see people come out on the streets, people question uh, some of the beliefs that they've always held for granted, uh, you know, at least attempt to come to a reckoning with the, the original sin of the founding of this country. Yes. Uh, and and that, um, that really uh, it, it makes me incredibly happy and hopeful. When it comes to immigration, I'm less hopeful. Um, many countries have used COVID as an excuse to cut down on migration, to draw uh, uh, their borders um, even tighter, to impose all kinds of restrictions. Uh, in this country, the Trump administration has just gone to town, not just on the undocumented, but also on legal immigration. Mm -hmm. And we know this at, uh, at NYU and you know, the um, incredibly arduous rules uh, put on foreign students. Um, every week, there's a new rule uh, limiting access to American higher education, which is about the stupidest policy that we could carry out. We need these students, not just because they pay full freight, but America's intellectual and scientific life would be crippled without foreign students. Um, uh, but I don't know how many people in the sort of, it, is, it still astonishes me that 41% of the country will vote for Trump. Um, and uh, this 41 percent uh, we've seen is resistant to expertise, resistant to economic arguments. Um, and when it comes to immigration, even under a Biden administration, I'm not sure how much we can turn back the clock because a lot of this in this country, a lot of the resistance um, is also the uh, territory that Pamela covered so well, which is white fear, white fear of being overwhelmed, of this being a majority minority country by 2044. Um, and, uh, and this is something which is not easily going to go away, uh, even if Biden becomes president. I want to ask the two of you sort of in your we're concluding moments here, Pamela, a question came in, um, what would you propose to reform education and maybe the economy to actually implement what you define as justice, racial justice, not just diversity programs, because you're saying it's ultimately not a zero sum game. And so Ketu, the same question for you. You've said immigration is actually not a loss. And if immigrants, if people who are here undocumented were actually removed at large scale, the entire economy would collapse. So how would you make this argument to the people in power, sort yeah. of who are doing education ec economics or the corporation? Yeah, it, it's, it's going to be hard to answer that in, a few, in even a few minutes. But um, so, <laughs> right. yeah, part of the problem is that a lot of the diversity initiatives that are now in practice don't work. They just don't work. Like there's no evidence that shows they work. The needle's not moving. Yeah, companies are continuing to spend billions on it. So what I'm arguing is that we need a, a, a strategy that is far more holistic, um, beginning with education. Um, back to what Suketu was saying, tell her, telling the, the greater story of America, um, a story in which you know African Americans were not just slaves, and then the civil rights movement came, and then they were totally equal with. With, with whites across the board, like telling these far more complex stories because Americans are intelligent enough to take <laughs> the true history of this country. So that needs to start. It needs to start at a much um, lower grade, like just even the intervention of, of the New York Times with the, you know, looking at the 400 years. I think, I think so many of these stories have never been told. And I, as if it's going to break America if they if we learn the truth, but we're starting to see interventions. We're seeing Confederate monuments finally fall. We're seeing the names of people who were dishonorable people being removed from the you know the front of a school. We're seeing Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima being retired from you know the box of products. So 
we're seeing this recognition that all of this matters, the public iconography, the films, the, it, the air that we breathe has to be cleansed of all of these toxicities um, that, that has, has allowed people to be demonized, to be demeaned, to, to be treated as less than. So there's no one way to do it. And certainly you're not going to accomplish this in a one hour mandatory training session, which studies have conclusively pretty much shown that not only do they not work, but they trigger a backlash oftentimes. And five years later, the percentage of black women and black men, uh, Asian men and women in management actually goes down five years after this, this mandatory training. So I'm just suggesting like, let's do something new. And there are models, there are successful models that, uh, that I do cite in, in the book that companies can begin to look uh, more closely at interventions rather than just pouring money into ineffective strategies? Uh, so I really don't agree um, with almost anything that Steve Bannon uh, says, but there is <laughs> one thing, one uh, area of commonality we have. And he once said that the origins of the current wave of populism um, are in the 2008 financial crisis, where people's futures were stolen from them. Um, and across the Western world, a large uh, part of the white working class found that they are, you know, they'd been sold these mortgages that they couldn't afford, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs, and they were angry. And meanwhile, they were seeing all these people, places like Wall Street, places like New York, get even richer. Today, um, six men, own more than half of all human beings combined. So six men own more than something like three and a half billion human beings. So people are mad as hell. Um, and with uh, the economic effects of COVID, they're going to continue to be mad and get even madder. So they're looking for someone to blame. Now, they would ordinarily come for the elites with pitchforks but the elites being no fools, know that this kind of anger has to be diverted um, away from themselves. And who better um, to divert it onto than the newest, the weakest, the immigrants. Hannah Arendt called it the alliance between the mob and capital. Uh, so in my book, I have a whole chapter where I go to a, um, a factory town in Pennsylvania and speak to the inhabitants there about how their future was stolen. Um, you know, in the 20th century, they all, all had good union jobs and a, a house and a garage and a, you know, maybe even a boat. Um, and now their kids are uh, in uh, hooked on meth or in the military, uh, you know, these are ghost towns. So the narrative is that in these towns, they really believe that uh, Mexicans are coming for their jobs that the wall needs to be built because they're living in such economic desperation that they can't afford to compete with uh, these people who will work longer and harder than them. And so it's not all ascribed to, to racism in, in the case of resistance to immigration. There's genuine economic fear, which I believe should be addressed. But there's intelligent ways of doing it. For example, with the expansion of the earned income tax credit, which helps both immigrants and uh, the working class. Uh, or with, there could be, fees levied on some of the tech companies that do so well through immigration. And this fee could be used to help struggling border communities or um, school districts in Long Island, which have a flood of new students that need bilingual education. You know, or uh, migrants could be directed to going to um, empty parts of the country, like rural Maine or Vermont, uh, or uh, cities like Baltimore or Detroit, you know, where we need um, warm bodies for cold cities. So there's a program called uh, the Heartland Visa, which a, a group of American mayors are advocating for. So there's intelligent ways of managing migrant inflows. But the problem is that the debate around immigration is basically all heat and no light. Um, 
And so the way we, we do it is, you know, it's not going to be easy, uh, but we have to recognize both um, the, uh, the reasons for populist rage and the ways in which the elites manipulate this kind of populism to serve their own economic ends. And in the end, the hope really is for some sort of class consciousness, the understanding um, uh, between these people in this factory town in Pennsylvania that these migrants who are coming are not their enemies. They're actually, they should be allies um, and, and direct their anger on um, the, the causes for systemic inequality and racism in the country. I want to thank the two of you, and I really want to also underline them. Um, we're really so so uh, honored and so happy that you took the time to do this, and but mostly really for committing yourself to correcting this narrative. So I just want to recommend these books to our listeners and viewers because we'll post this. This land is our land, and immigration and immigrants manifesto, Sopiro Meta, and then Pamela Newkirk's Diversity Inc. The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, which both of these books contain something positive at the end. So it's very important to underline that you're analyzing a situation in order to change something. And I really want to commend you for putting these books out. I just want to thank the two of you. And I've learned an enormous amount. Um, and I, all I can do is just recommend and promote these books um, and get you out there to talk to more people. Thank you, Uli. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much, Pamela. It's been really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.